I'd like to introduce our second keynote speaker for today, PJM Interconnections President and CEO Manu Astana. Manu stepped into his current role at PJM in 2020, right at the start of a pandemic. Great time to transition and meet your team. Uh, and has focused his time and energy since then on risk management and reform, as well as the goal of maintaining a reliable, reliable grid while we deal with the energy transition. Prior to leading PJM, Manu served as president of Direct Energy Home in North America. Before that, he spent 12 years at TXU Energy, where he began in a trading role and ended as a senior vice president. Manu received his education from the Wharton School, where he graduated with a degree in finance and entrepreneurial management. Today, Manu's comments are gonna focus on powering a reliable transition. I think probably everyone in this room has either seen or read the report that PJM issued a couple of Fridays ago, uh, and he'll share PJM's perspective. You're, uh, you're aware of that, and I'm sure he is open to questions about it. In fact, he's asked us to make sure that we save time for questions, so we're gonna do that. So as you all know, and since I screwed it up on the first speaker, we're gonna try and correct it the second go around after lunch. While Manu is speaking, you are of course able to submit your questions uh, using the website or the app with the QR code, which is on your table. So uh, please do not hesitate to do so. Um, and uh, you can use the same code as we used this morning uh, for the previous polls and Q&A, and you'll find a space there to submit your question. So with that, I would ask you to join me in welcoming Manu Astana to the podium. Should I help you up? <laughs> Thanks, Todd. You bet. All yours. I have a series of canned uh, jokes about how I got this injury, so feel free to ask me afterward. Well, good afternoon, folks. Hope you had a great lunch, um, and I will do my best to dispel the post-lunch uh, sleepies. Uh, thank you, Todd, and thank you, EPSA, for having me. It is, uh, it is really an honor. Our Generators are absolutely critical stakeholders for us at PJM. Uh, and so uh, I really value this time to be able to talk to part of our generator community. Uh, and hopefully we will have a good Q&A afterward. I, I plan to speak for, you know, 15, 20 minutes and then uh, like to address sort of whatever is on your mind. As you know, PJM is a regional transmission organization. Uh, we coordinate the movement of wholesale electricity in 13 states uh, and the District of Columbia. The organization was formed in, uh, in a previous incarnation, but, uh, but sort of traceable in September of 1927. And we have been a continuous power pool ever since. Uh, as such, our focus is... Uh, and you hear a lot going on at PGM, right? There's a lot uh, happening in the stakeholder process. There's a lot happening at FERC related to PGM. But I think it's important to boil it down. Uh, and to boil it down, our focus is reliability. Since 1927, that has been our focus, uh, and that continues to be our focus. But what's unique about PGM um, uh, and other ISOs and RTOs is that we try to deliver reliability through Number one, excellent operations. Number two, uh, thoughtful uh, and expert forward transmission planning. And uh, equally, if not more important, number three, the power of our competitive markets. And I'll talk about our markets um, uh, in a couple of minutes, but I think that's, that's really important to emphasize. So reliability through everything that we do, which brings me to the topic for today's discussion, right? Powering a reliable energy transition. Now, I spent a lot of time, I live in Pennsylvania, uh, but I still identify my home state as Texas. And uh, if you are from Houston or have been to Houston, you know what has been going on, so you'll understand the next comment. Right? This energy transition we're going through at PGM is not our first rodeo. It's not our first rodeo. Uh, we have been through a pretty significant energy transition already. Uh, and I pull out some facts and figures. 2005 to 2020, pardon me. Two thousand and five through two thousand and twenty. And in two thousand and five, PGM's generation mix was fifty seven percent coal, five percent gas, and then nuclear and and other. Uh, nuclear has been pretty steady throughout. But 57% coal, 5% gas. If you look in 2020, 
uh, we were 19% coal and 40% gas. And I'm not saying that is either good or bad, right? I'm not saying that is either good or bad, but I'm saying that is a huge transition. If you think about carbon emissions rate, over that period dropped 39%. Think about the rate of NOx emissions, and this is the rate of emissions, not the absolute emissions. The absolute emission drop was even more. NOx emissions dropped 86%, sulfur dioxide 95%. That's a huge transition. So this is not our first rodeo. Our markets, our members have powered a huge transition before and have done it extremely successfully. And I didn't want to, as I talk about the next transition, and I talk about some of my concerns around the path that we're on and ways that I think that we can de-risk the path that we're on, I don't want to lose that point. I continue to believe, with a lot of evidence, by the way, uh, that markets and competition are the best way to achieve this transition, as they were to achieve the prior trans uh, transition. And in fact, thanks to your investment, thanks to the scale that we have at PGM, thanks to sort of our expertise and the work of all of our members, our markets uh, and our work deliver, we estimate between three and $4 billion a year of value. Um, and so I, I can't emphasize this enough. I think there are many ways to accomplish this transition. I hear people express concerns about, you know, how can we trust the invisible hand of the market to do this? I think the market has proven that it can do this. Having said that, I do think there's need for some tweaks and edits to our market rules, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. But let me talk about this transition, and I wanted to talk about specifically a paper that PJM put out recently that has um, a, uh, an interesting name. It's called the Resource Retirements, Replacements, and Risks, or the four-hour four -hour paper. And I asked my team last year to look at what path are we on? That was a question. I said by 2030, and then we picked 2030 because that's a period that is close enough that we can actually see it and action it, but far enough away that there actually, there's time for the transition to really take root. And I asked by 2030, what path are we on? Are we going to have adequate resources? Are we going to be able to keep the grid reliable? And I wanted to share the results of that paper with you. Um, and I, I, won't, you know, I won't get to the punchline here. Um, like any good research study that, that's based on assumptions, the answer, of course, is you know, maybe. Um, but if I think about the pieces and I break it down, right, think about the existing generation that we have in PGM today. It's, a, it's about a 190 gigawatt system. Our load is about 150 gigawatts. So we have a lot of reserves today. We have a very healthy reserve margin in PGM today. By 2030, we see that there's 40 gigawatts and perhaps more of generation that is at risk of retirement. And the majority of this generation is at risk of retirement for policy reasons. And it's, it's, uh, it's a series of policies, state policies, EPA policies, other environmental policies, but it's notable that it's at risk for retirement for policy reasons because policy reasons are harder to reverse, right? It's not that you can send a, a market price signal that will necessarily override um, policy signals. Um, it is worth noting, though, that several of our states have worked with us to put reliability off-ramps in place for their policies, but still, we believe up to 40 gigawatts, maybe more, of generation is at risk for retirement by 2030. So that's one piece of it. The next piece of it is load. So what happens to load by 2030? Again, very hard to predict with any accuracy, but we think there are reasons to believe that there's going to be significant growth in load by 2030. And we in the United States have enjoyed for years kind of flat to reducing load. In some places, some parts of the country, it's been going up. But overall, energy efficiency has been helping drive load a little bit lower over time, which is a great thing. But I think we're poised on the verge of significant load growth. Number one, from data centers. And PJM actually is home to one of the largest data center centers in the world. 70% of the internet, of the world's internet traffic, I'm told, flows through 
one county in Virginia, uh, pretty close to here near, near DC airport, Loudoun County, which is in PJM. And we're seeing there, other parts of Virginia, Ohio, other parts of the system, significant load growth from data centers. In fact, by 2030, that could be as high as 10, 15 gigawatts alone from data centers. On top of that, we're seeing significant policy pressure for electrification, whether it's electrification of heating load, of transportation load. And so when you put all that together, I believe there is significant upward pressure on load. Um, and I think over and above what our current um, load forecasts capture. And so we're working quite carefully to think about what that could look like. But our paper that we put out actually does try to quantify a, high, a higher load scenario. So retiring generation, increasing load. You know, suddenly that 150 gigawatt to 190 gigawatt reserve margin starts to look really not enough by 2030. So then you look at, okay, what new generation is going to show up by that? First of all, I think it's important to note that we have a lot of new generation in our interconnection queue. We've got 260 gigawatts. It's, our system is a 190 gigawatt system. We have 260 gigawatts of generation in the interconnection queue with more coming behind that. So there's a lot of new generation coming, or at least so it appears at first. And frankly, there's a lot of generation coming because there's a lot of policy support for that generation. There's a lot of consumer support for that generation. But off that 260 gigawatts, and we have um, 36 gigawatts through the queue already that has signed interconnection service agreements. We have another seven gigawatts through the queue that is out for signature. So we have significant quantities of generation that are through the queue. Last year, we saw less than two gigawatts of generation actually come online. Less than two gigawatts. When you do the math, when you look at the rate of retirements, you look at the rate of load growth, and you add in the current rate of throughput from our queue, we are headed for some trouble. Uh, and that trouble is likely to find us later in this decade. So that's what we say in the paper, right? And that's not the conclusion. We're not saying that we're going to have a reliability problem. What we're saying is that there are a lot of pressures that are pushing us in that direction. And so now is the time for us to act to de-risk um, de the future, de-risk resource adequacy for the future uh, to make sure that we have enough resources when we get to the later part of this decade. And of course, there's additional work for us to do together to make sure that the resources we do have now continue to perform as well. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, so how do I think about what needs to happen to de-risk the future? I think the math is pretty straightforward. And I think we need to add faster. I think we need to get through and process our interconnection queues faster. There's work for PJM and our members to do on that. We have actually recently uh, spent a year and a half on some significant reform that uh, FERC has, uh, has approved and now we're in the process of implementing. But I think we need to do even more. And our teams are working back uh, at the office feverishly to hire people and we've hired a lot of people to hire consultants, to automate processes, to, to get new tools to accelerate throughput of the queue. I'm not sure that'll be enough though. And I think there's a lot of uh, supply chain pressure that is holding up the queue. I don't think it's just interconnection processing, although we need to move faster on interconnection processing. I think there are siting issues we're hearing from our developers that they're running into. And I think those are just realities, right? PGM is committed to facilitating the decarbonization policies of our states. So I'm not here to say these are, you know, these, these are the wrong policies, these are unachievable policies. I'm here to say how do we achieve them and also to say that the path that we're on at the moment is not headed for a reliable system. So I think we need to get ourselves on a different path. Uh, and I think the best way to do that is using the markets that have gotten us through the last transition. But I do think the markets need some modification. So add faster, but I also think we need to subtract slower 
and subtract generation only when the replacement generation is here at scale. And I, uh, I really think that's, that's critical from a market design perspective, but also a policy design perspective that goes far beyond the walls and the control of PGM, other than through sort of sharing information and sharing data like this. Our board has recognized this. We have recognized this. I mean, I've been sort of sharing this message, and I know Jim Robb uh, spoke to you this morning, um, and I've spoken a lot with Jim as well, uh, and I know he shares the same concerns and similar messages as well around concerns around future reliability and the, and the need to act now to make sure that those concerns don't come true. Um, but our board has taken action. We have just recently issued an, uh, a letter initiating an accelerated stakeholder process to try to action some of the things that we need to do to make sure that we can, can maintain reliability. And that stakeholder process is very focused on the capacity market. Right? It's focused on a few issues in the capacity market having to do with how we think about, quantify, and model risk in the winter. Uh, and all our modeling suggests that as we get a more electrified system, we will and a more um, solar dependent, uh, intermittent dependent system, the risk is going to shift to the winter. So how do we quantify the risk in the winter to make sure that we're actually purchasing an adequate supply of capacity for the winter? The second question that we're looking at is how do we accredit capacity? So how do we actually think about the ability for a generator to provide capacity when we need it the most? Um, and I think there are lessons there also from Winter Storm Elliott that I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A. The third question that we're asking is, how do we think about our capacity performance construct? Uh, and you know, we, we did have some significant rate of uh, generator outages during Elliott, and we have a very significant uh, quantity of potential penalties that we're working through right now for generators. And I think it's appropriate for us to ask ourselves, is that penalty structure correct into the future? Did it achieve what it needed to achieve? Do we need to make modifications to it? And also I think it's appropriate to ask, is the risk that capacity suppliers are taking on as a result of their capacity commitment and that capacity penalty structure, are they able to pass that through in their offers? Right? And so I think those are some of the questions that the board has asked us and our members to come back to them with a potential set of solutions with a target filing date of October 1st. So we're working through that process, uh, and I think it's critical for us to get through it. Um, I think the only way we're gonna get through it well is through partnering with our members and our stakeholders. And so part of what I wanted to say to you today uh, is I appreciate all of your uh, sometimes very vigorous engagement in our stakeholder process, uh, but, and I encourage it. Right? We, we may not always agree uh, on any specific topic, but we are always made better through your input and through your feedback. And we do sometimes agree. Too. It's just not that we always disagree either. Um, so I was here, I really just wanted to implore all of you to continue to engage with us in our stakeholder process and help us get these reforms that we want to make to our capacity market right uh, for the next decade. Because I think it is critical for us to support our policymakers in trying to achieve their energy transition objectives, but really to do it in a way that's reliable and cost effective uh, using the power of markets and using the power of competition. The other thing I'll briefly touch on, and, and that was a lot, so I apologize for that, but the other thing I'll briefly touch on is just generator performance, right? Because if I think about reliability in PGM, I think of it across three sort of time scales. The nearest time scale is now and the next few years, right? And it, it, it has to do with performance. It has to do with performance of our generation fleet but also what can we do as PGM to support that performance, right? It's not just all on our generators. Um, what can we do together to make sure that our generators can show up and perform when we need them? And to me that in the, in the near term is the reliability imperative. In the intermediate term, and right, in the latter part of this decade, it is about resource adequacy. And 
about all of what I told you with our um, energy transition report, but also the stakeholder process that we have initiated. And in the longer term, it is about more uh, uh, energy uh, attributes, things like inertia, system inertia, and that sort of thing, which as we look at our models, we think is, uh, is fairly far out in the future because PGM is still a system that has relatively low renewable penetration. So we've got a long way to go. Um, so a ton of work for us to do, a lot of work already initiated, some more work that we are going to initiate um, around shorter term performance once we get through the lessons off Winter Storm Elliott, but I suspect that work will include things around power to gas coordination um, and uh, potentially also just looking at our reserve markets and making sure that we've got the right incentives and the right ability to pay generators for providing reserves um, when we need to. Um, and then all of this capacity market work. So a lot of work and I know it is tempting uh, and I know there are voices out there that are using this opportunity to say, hey, are markets actually even the right tool to do this work? Uh, and I think that drumbeat is going to just continue because there are a lot of people that have entrenched positions against markets. I would submit to you every grid operator in the world is struggling with these questions, whether they are markets-based, whether they are not markets-based. And in fact, within PGM, we have vertically integrated utilities. We've got restructured utilities. We've got a whole mix of participants who have all benefited from our market structure that we have collectively put in place and nurtured over the last you know, 25 years. Um, and um, I think the evidence is strong that there are billions of dollars of efficiency to be had through the power of competitive markets. And so I encourage everyone to remember that as we think about the future and think about designing uh, the changes to our markets. They're complex but very, very necessary and very, very worth it. So that is what I had in terms of prepared comments. I was going to ask Todd to come up and maybe we'll both sit here and take, uh, take questions and have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Go ahead. I'll You're on the far side. Make your walk further. Thanks a lot. <laughs> in a surprise to no one, Manu's comments, the questions are coming in fast and furious. So we have plenty of things to talk about. So. Uh, we will jump right in. I will try hard not to enforce the 25-word rule, but I have got a laundry list of questions that folks have. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's to, do it. So let's get started. So you mentioned a lot in your comments about uh, the market and how it works and how it functions and how we should rely on it. Obviously, those are things that we all believe. But you're also struggling with issues that are, have downstream impacts on the mixed signals that we all are getting from state and federal regulators with regard to policy preferences, and system reliability. And so how do you think about reconciling state or federal policy decisions that are made in a vacuum, and then you're the, well, you and we, in many instances, are expected to execute and deliver on policy outcomes that are very aspirational, but may be disconnected from operational reality? Yeah, thanks, Todd. I mean, look, <laughs> I, tend to be, I tend to be an optimist, right? So I do think there are solutions to those questions. And I think that in our system of government, we elect people to implement policies, right? And those people are implementing the policies. And, and we are working hard with our states to inform them, to educate them, to answer their questions, and in many cases to partner with them to help them directly achieve their policies. And I'll, I'll point to our partnership with the state of New Jersey as an example. Uh, we work with them over a year and a half to procure uh, competitively transmission to serve 7,500 megawatts of offshore wind. They spent $1.1 billion on that. Uh, and they saved uh, hundreds of millions of dollars as a result of working with us and looking for competitive solutions at scale together. So I think there are solutions. I think it's important to work with our states. But I also think it's important to have a big, diverse footprint. Right, part of what we bring at PGM, and that makes PGM complicated, is we've got such a big, diverse footprint with such different policy objectives. But I think it's also a huge advantage for us, because if you think about where we are, we're sitting on top of the Marcellus, we're sitting on top of the Utica. The conventional wisdom is that you know, we're gonna have all of this wind in the middle part of our country, and we do. If you look at the wind penetration 
in the center part of our country, and we're hitting 80s and 90 percent some days and some hours of some days. And so the conventional wisdom is, well, of course, you know, build more wires and that energy is going to flow into PGM. Well, what's actually happening is most hours of the year, energy is flowing out of PGM because it's gas by wire. It's the cheap shale gas that we have access to. And I think that's a critical resource. So I think the diversity and size of the footprint also, I think, is going to be key to help states achieve their objectives while keeping the lights on. And I think the fact that we have a diverse set of objectives actually can be a benefit. I wish you the best of luck with Thank that. Thank you, Todd. All right. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of the things you mentioned is subtracting slower, uh, because clearly there is a retirement problem uh, that you've identified. It's not a certainty, but it's a potential. It's an outcome that you've mentioned. How would you have assets retire or subtract slower in today's markets where policies are pushing units offline sooner rather than later? I mean, it's, that's really the pressure point between state policies and your requirement to operate the grid reliably. How would you have those assets exit slower? Yeah, I mean, part of it, Todd, I think, is working with our state policymakers to actually <clears throat> bake that sort of reliability off-ramp into their policies. Uh, now, you know, I'm sure that there are folks who would who would design the off-ramps differently, mm -hmm. right, and who would design different policies. But ultimately, they, those are the folks that were elected to make policy. And so the best we can do, I think, is work with them to design those off-ramps to work with states that are considering new policies to make sure that they are thinking about the need to keep these generators around until the replacement is here at scale. But I also think the things I talked about, calculating the, the winter risk, it seems like an esoteric thing, right? So someone's calculating risk. But what that translates into is us buying the right amount of capacity mm -hmm. and thus sending the right price signals through the capacity market uh, and accrediting generators that we think will actually perform in those hours. And I think those price signals are really important. Right? They're really important. They're not going to override or change the policy choices, but not all of those retirements are policy-based retirements. Several of them are economic mm -hmm. retirements too, so I think it's important to send the right price signal. And then ultimately, if we need new generation, new transition resources, I think that price signal is going to be key for that as well. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, and it's like you've read the card ahead of me, so I'll ask you the question. I feel question. like I'm falling into some sort of trap here, but thanks, Don. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> if, if you had to give three reasons, or, or pick a number, but if you had to give some reasons why private capital should invest in generation assets in PJM right now, what would those be? I mean, and that's, of course, in the vacuum of we have policy disagreements. We've got, you know, as we, we were kind of laughing that we're often on the other side of the issues of these days, but at the end, we're all trying to achieve that reliable outcome. And so we're litigating, we're, you know, having discussions at FERC and what have you. But if private capital looks for certainty and it wants to invest, why, what are the three reasons that you would give equity to say PJM is still a, a place that you should invest your dollars? Yeah, yeah, no, I think some of the reasons, I don't know if there'll be three or not, but there's a need. Right? There's, there's a fundamental demand for mm -hmm. that reliability service. We have markets that have demonstrated over decades that they compensate generators appropriately. But not every generator, right? That's the part of, part of the magic of a competitive market. Not everyone is guaranteed uh, that they're going to succeed. But certainly the, the, the best position generators have done really well in our markets. Um, <clears throat> and we're committed to sort of continuing uh, to design our market rules to make sure there's an adequate price signal. And I will say there is a significant flow of capital into PGM, even today. And I've had conversations with people in this audience who have um, invested in buying um, you know, big companies in PGM recently, uh, invested in buying transition assets. Uh, we were having a conversation earlier with the plan to actually hold onto the sites and use those capacity injection rights for uh, different types of assets. So I, th I think we're seeing the power of innovation and the, uh, the incredible um, skills in this community and beyond uh, start to innovate around what it is clear mm -hmm. that we need together. So I think, I think there's a compelling investment case and, and we're committed to making sure that our markets uh, continue to send the right price signal. Kind of a two-parter, so I'll start with the first one and let you take that where you want, and maybe we'll come to the second one or not. But the dynamic between PGM and FERC has changed in recent years, or certainly that's the view of the questioner, and I think I'd agree with that. Given that some of our current FERC commissioners seem to believe that markets are irretrievably broken, 
how would you respond to the criticism? And what do you think are the steps that we need to either correct or educate those who believe that the markets just aren't delivering and, you know, either some other model, I won't, I won't presume to know what they think the right model is, but clearly markets are not it. How do you respond to that and what do we do to fix it? I mean, look, I think it's a bit tongue in cheek, right? I think it's like Churchill said about democracy. It's the worst system of government except for all the others. So I think markets are like that. I think, I think that it's easy to poke holes at the complexity of markets. I think our markets are particularly unique in that the demand side participation is um, less than you have in other markets. You're in the stock market, you have buyers, you have sellers, they meet, they form a price, and off you go. Mm -hmm. And in our markets, think of our capacity market, we have what is called a VRR curve. It's a demand curve that we administratively put in place through our FERC regulators, uh, or through, uh, through approval by FERC, that actually stands in for demand. And I think that that is used as evidence by some people uh, that, in fact, that's not a market. That's an administrative construct. And there's some truth to that, right? The demand side of the market is an approximation for what we think demand should pay. Now, it's, it's based on a ton of economic analysis. It's been vetted rigorously through our stakeholder process, including by the load side interests. It has been blessed at FERC. Um, and so I would, I think it's easy to get stuck in the perspective that the markets aren't perfect, that they are making some approximations. Even the ORDC pricing, right, the operating reserve demand curve, is an approximation for what load would be willing to pay in periods of scarcity. But I think that that set of market constructs results in measurably higher levels of efficiency for consumers and for producers. Uh, and so that's what we say, that's what we say when we hear that argument. Um, and that's what we believe. Uh, I'll resist the urge to share my opinion about how to respond to that, separate from maybe over at the reception. I'll I'd share love that. to hear it, yeah. <laughs> I'll bet you would. <laughs> I'm going to start asking you questions. <laughs> so um, uh, you mentioned capacity markets. So how do you see capacity mar markets helping to address resource adequacy and provide long-term price signals needed for resource development? I mean, if you look at New England, there are clearly states that are lamenting their situation, but if you say to them, as FERC did at a meeting, do you want to take over resource adequacy? The answer is not just no, it's emphatically no. How do you in PJM, situated differently than New England, look at how capacity markets are helping address resource adequacy? Yeah, I mean, the whole concept of capacity markets is to address resource adequacy, right? It's, it's to, you know, the concept was a three-year ahead market, and so you've got time to build a new generator if you need it. Mm -hmm. Send a price signal that's, uh, that could be higher than the, the, the rate of return required for a new generator to build. Uh, now, those markets have run into some uh, rough weather. Right? We have been through market delays. We have been through back and forth on the minimum offer price rule, which is still on appeal, and so we'll see how that appeal goes. Indeed. Uh, and I think those delays are, uh, they're not helpful. And so I do think we need to get back to a regular schedule of auctions and try to find some stability and predictability in our market rules. And I think that's probably more important than getting the rules just perfect. Because I don't think there is a just perfect. I think that we're gonna have to accept that there's a, uh, there's a zone of, um, of very good that we're gonna to have to live with. And if we can find a consensus zone that is stable for a period of time, uh, that is much better than a quixotic uh, quest for the perfect. I don't think anyone would uh, dispute the need for certainty it would be great for a longer period of time. Speaking of which, uh, when Jim Robb was here this morning, he suggested that reserve margin isn't as helpful a metric as it used to be, given some of the issues that are happening with the system. So what other metrics well, I guess I'll ask you, do you share Jim's view? But then if you do or if you don't, what other metrics might be things that PGM should focus on as it looks to ensure reliability? Yeah, I mean, I think reserve margin is important, right? But it's not, um, it's not exclusive. Um, you need capacity that is going to perform. We saw that in Winter Storm Uri in Texas, where going into the winter, ERCOT had an adequate amount of capacity, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they had significant performance issues. Uh, we saw that in Elliott as well, across uh, much of the nation, where there was um, <clears throat> uh, capacity, but we had uh, some performance issues. So I think it's important for the capacity to be able to perform, but you can't perform if you don't exist. So we need to have right. an adequate amount of capacity in the first instance. 
The other thing I'll say um, in our stakeholder process that we're going through to, to look at our capacity market, we have just proposed a different reliability metric. So forever, uh, and I think this is embedded in NERC standards, you know, systems in the US planned a one in 10 year loss of load expectation. Uh, and we are proposing, at least our initial proposal is to move to an estimated unserved energy sort of approach. And the, you know, it's lots of jargon, but bottom line is you're looking at not only the number of reliability events you have, but also the severity of the reliability events. Um, because I think society can live with um, <clears throat> some reliability events once in a while. It's impossible to build a system uh, to, that's, that's sort of 100% all the time because uh, there's always something that can happen. Uh, but I do think it's, it's critical to make sure the system is resilient uh, and recovers quickly. Mm -hmm. A um, little bit of a self-interested question uh, that I'll put Absolute up here. Absolute is great. I love Absolute. <laughs> <laughs> Not that self-interested. Um, so Jim Robb said this morning that he was disappointed in EPSA for opposing the NERC uh, reliability um, filing about um, uh, the new standard. Um, I think it is important to clarify we were not opposed to the new standard, but there's no compensation mechanism in place. So if we're going to have these additional standards, is, is PJM in a position to say that it would support creating a competitive solution for that with its rules to ensure that there is a manner in which resources can be paid for this new requirement that would be put on them? I mean, that, that's really the crux of it. I mean, it's, it's, we're back to my uh, example this morning about Virgil Solazzo and Don Corleone. It's about the money. So your best of interest, you know, best of luck with your interests, so long as they're not opposed to mine. We're just trying to figure out how we can adequately be compensated for that new requirement. Is that something that you think about, and is that something that you would consider putting into the rules to ensure that there is a way to be compensated for that? Yeah, look, I think we need a stronger, and we are on the record. We and the other ISOs and RTOs are on the record of um, filing at FERC to say that FERC should accept the NERC winter winterization standard, but actually send NERC and all of us back to work on a more uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, and even higher standard. And so that's what we believe. Uh, we believe it strongly. Uh, and I do believe that generators should be able to get compensated for their cost of, of meeting that standard. And I think uh, that should happen in a market environment, ideally. But if, if not, any environment, right? I do think that it's <laughs> uh, standards do come with cost. And, right. Um, we've talked about gas and electric related issues, and I'm just curious if you have some high level or, or detailed comments, frankly, for that matter, about how you're thinking about gas electric coordination. It's, it's clearly one of the two or three issues that is occupying a lot of our time these days, in particular as a result of URI, then Elliott, and nobody wants to have a third occurrence. So how are you thinking about um, the gas electric coordination issue, and then what solution sets are you thinking about, or, or kind of where are you on the road to coming up with solutions? Because I know, I know we've talked about this a little. I'm curious if you've got thoughts to share. Yeah. So at a high level, you know, in Elliott, the good news is the, the PJM grid stayed reliable. Right? We did not have any firm load shed, although we did have demand response deployment. <clears throat> but we, as I said, we, we had a lot of generator outages. In fact, at peak, we think we had roughly 46,000 megawatts of genera generator outages and another 6,000 megawatts that were late to start. And so it was, it, was, uh, it was a tough event. And as we break down w what the reasons were for the outage, about 25% roughly at peak were fuel related. And so that's what your question is about. The other 75% were not fuel related. So I think it's, and thus your previous question, the winter winterization standards. For the fuel related outages, we have heard <clears throat> some um, really useful, enlightening, I think, feedback. I think one point of feedback that we got uh, was really from the gas industry around uh, freeze-offs in the Marcellus shale. We had uh, one-third of Northeast gas production freeze. And we had actually asked this question of the gas industry after winter storm Uri in Texas around our vulnerability in our region to that sort of freeze-off. And I think we and the gas industry believed that actually we were adequately winterized up in the Northeast. And it turns out we encountered a condition for which we were not ready. Right? The, the gas industry um, had some real difficulty, and that translated through to our gas-fired generators. In fact, most of the outages that we saw were on, the majority were on the gas-fired generators. So I think that is something we need to plan for and think about. I think the fact that it was a long weekend, and we uh, clear the market every day, um, and uh, 
Uh, people had to think about buying a package of four-day package of gas based on what we thought, we as PGM and collectively we as stakeholders thought, the conditions were going into the event. Uh, and our load forecast was low. The conditions turned out to be more extreme. Uh, I think that combination of things made it hard for people over a long weekend to get gas who otherwise might have been able to get gas. And so we got to think about what are we going to do differently collectively next time we're headed into a similar event. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that people uh, don't have this choice or uh, are compensated for this choice of thinking about, I got to buy a four-day package of gas because I might be called. I'm showing PGM that I'm available, but I don't actually know that I'm available because I haven't gotten to try to get the gas. Um, I think that this sort of four-day package of gas versus a one-day-at-a-time uh, uh, clearing of the market by in the electric side has the potential to create this sort of event again. And I think we need to work with our partners on the gas side and our generators uh, to find a solution, whether that's changing the electric day or changing the gas day or, uh, or thinking about our reserve markets and thinking about ways to compensate generators to make sure that they can buy the gas um, and be paid for it. So lots of potential solutions. Mm -hmm. We're still working on a root cause analysis of the issues. So consider what I'm saying as um, sort of our initial thinking but it'll continue to be informed by what we find uh, with our event analysis. But I think it, it's clearly something that we need to address to enable us to access the generation that we need when we need it. Right, and, and a challenge. It, it's a five day a year problem. It's not a 365 day a year problem, but it's mission critical when it happens. And yeah. all of us end up in a position we'd rather not be in answering questions that we think we have answers to, and it turns out conditions maybe were different. So. You've, you've talked about the states and the diversity that you have to struggle with and that Awesome is stuck dealing with, um, I'm sorry, has the opportunity to deal with uh, in dealing with states. How do you have to tailor your message to deal with the various political jurisdictions that PGM encompasses? You have very blue states, you have very red states. I regret that we have to start labeling our states in color because of energy policy, but that's where we find ourselves. How, how are you able to tailor that message and be the disinterested truth teller who can say, look, you, you can pass what you want, but the lights will go out if you do that. Or maybe you're not saying that, maybe you're being more delicate than I am, perhaps. But how, how do you navigate that, and how do you try to share the message that policymakers need to hear? Because as you said, they're driving these decisions, but sometimes their policies aren't exactly helping us with reliability. Yeah, look, we're the, we think of, we're the interested truth teller, right? We're, we're definitely interested in reliability. We're interested in helping our states achieve their decarbonization objectives as well, uh, but doing it reliably. So we, we try to say the same thing, Todd, mm -hmm. regardless of who we're talking to. Whether I'm talking to you, I'm talking to our other members, whether we're talking to states, we try to say the same thing. We have the same reliability report we've put out. We share that with, mm -hmm. uh, with all of our states. We take all of their questions. Uh, we partner with all of them to help achieve their particular objectives. Uh, and I think that's... Uh, we don't have different messages for different different um, audiences. That would not work well right? Right. <laughs> because they talk to each other. Um, so we, we try to say the same thing wherever we go. All right, I think we're technically in the speed round, or at least one of these questions is a speed round question. So as you look at your analysis that you did for the retirement study, the four R's, if Illinois repealed CJA, would that change your reliability prognosis? Or is that just one of many, I'm sure it's one of many inputs, but would that fundamentally change your analysis? I don't know if it would fundamentally change the analysis. I think it is, CJA is important. Uh, it's, an, it's an important part of uh, the retirements. It's a meaningful driver of the retirements. But <clears throat> Illinois has also given PGM a reliability off-ramp within CJA mm -hmm. to try to keep generators around that we need for reliability, and they have partnered with us on that. And they have also baked in incentives for new generation to show up at the sites of the retiring generators, um, which I think is a really clever thing. And so CJ is a multifaceted thing, and we need to make sure that, uh, <clears throat> that we help, uh, like with all our states, help that policy uh, objective be successful. So it's a hypothetical that I'm right. not answering directly. Fair enough. But, uh, Noted. You're good at this. You've done it before. <laughs> all right. So uh, I think maybe one or two, uh, and then we will let you t escape from the beating. So what are the best ways that you view to ensure balancing needs when addressing uh, large amounts of variable resources? As you know, PGM doesn't have a high penetration of renewables yet. It appears that that's in the queue. That's what's coming. Most of your queue is, in fact, renewable resources. How, how do you envision the best way to balance 
the needs of reliability while address, addressing it with variable resources? Well, I think part of it is forecasting. Right? It's really critical to be able to forecast what those renewable resources are going to do over the next operating period. But I think other than that, you need to have dispatchable generation and controllable load. And uh, that's what our markets need to make sure that we have an adequate supply of. Now, what makes up that dispatchable generation? I think over time it could end up being a variety of things. Right? It could be long duration batteries. Mm -hmm. It could be hydrogen storage. Uh, tied to power plants. I mean, there's a lot there. Um, at the moment, it's thermal resources. That is who, what our dispatchable resources are. And then we've got um, one of the largest demand response programs in the world as well that um, uh, is also dispatchable, but in our case, dispatchable in an emergency. So today, that's what it is, but I think over time, it's going to evolve as technology evolves. Mm -hmm.